So what I want to do now, because typically the problem with uh, free discussion is that it goes all over the place and, you know, at the end people are very confused. I think to some extent that is creative chaos that is desired, but I think one can structure it a little bit in order to make people benefit from listening to the interactions. So I've identified a number of different topics that I want to go through with the panelists and with you and uh, move from one to the next. And the first one that I'd like to discuss, and Asaf uh, mentioned that in his talk, um, was the fact that we hadn't, we didn't hear very much in your presentations about Syria. And uh, I wanted to start by asking the panelists to give me a very quick answer to whether they believe that Syria is a game changer for Al Qaeda or for the jihadist movement, and if so, why and how? David, you want to start? Y yes, I think it's absolutely a game changer. Uh, number one, Jabhat an Nusra is uh, learning how to uh, win hearts and minds in a way that this movement has not previously, I mean, including holding fun days for kids, uh, which are pretty remarkable things. Uh, I mean, they're, they're getting Didn't much. Can you just say there is a limit to what that can accomplish? Just 10 yes, minutes ago? Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and you know, we're talking about two different things, right? Okay. You know, on the way up and once you reach the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. I think that they're getting much better at on the way up, and they haven't thought through what happens once they reach the pinnacle. Okay. Um, so I think it's a game changer for on the way up. Uh, but number two, which something I think is actually far more important, is you know, when you look at all the foreign fighters who are there, uh, you have a lot. And when you go back, say you have, um, for just as, as a random number, uh, let's take one number that's been quoted kind of as a mid-range. Say you have 900 Tunisian foreign fighters there who go back to Tunisia. Tunisia is not a very big country. You have 11 million people there. Um, how do 900 foreign fighters going back get reincorporated. I mean, some of them will get arrested, um, but they're going to have a lot of trouble fitting into society. You also have major problems from Jordan. I think you could get foreign fighters returning and having integration troubles, which could create greater instability, particularly if they are networked back to AQ uh, in other areas. So for those two reasons, I think it is a game changer. Thomas? Um. Yes, I, I, I think it's a, it's a major development that gives the movement a huge boost um, uh, by, by offering ter territory and attracting a whole new generation of, of recruits, both within Syria, in, in the region, and beyond. Um, now, as I you know, argued yesterday, it's impossible to say exactly how big the spillover is going to be. Um, but there will be some. Uh, um, what, I mean, what I worry the most about is the post-Assad phase, uh, phase of, uh, um, you, and, and, the pro and the prospect of having an, an, an enclave uh, territory basically uh, dominated by Jihadi, jihadi groups that and, and if, if a civil war continues and no central authority to kind of establish uh, control this enclave can linger linger on and I um, I, su I, su I suspect that there will come a point in the post Assad phase will that where the international community will um, have to intervene uh, and deal with that enclave and and deal with the the, sort of the, the cluster of jihadi, jihadi groups there. And at that point, you get into the dilemma. Uh, you have this huge dilemma, you know, um, containing or uh, eliminating this presence um, and provoking uh, them, in, you know, or, or in changing, making them more anti Western. So, but, you know, we. How, how can we eliminate that presence without them turning, without them adopting a strategy of attacking war in the West? Because they can with considerable efficiency given the number of foreign fighters that they have. But let me push you on that. Why would that enclave in Syria be inherently more, be more problematic than other enclaves that we have seen in other parts of the world? Somalia, Libya maybe, 
other parts of the world where we have seen enclaves. Why is the enclave, the emerging enclave in Syria, a game changer? And why was Somalia not? Because it, uh, first of all, because it's going to be large with a lot of people. Uh, and secondly, because it, uh, it, it will cause a lot of problems in the region, in, in Syria and in the neighboring countries. Uh, to an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a on a scale that I think will be is larger than what AQAP can cause from from its base in southern Yemen or AQIM can can cause um, from uh, its uh, territory. You know, uh, so far you know the the the, the, sp the, the sp regional spillover from these other enclaves is is quite limited. You have a few things, you know, plus in Saudi, you have in Amanas, uh, etc. But I think the potential of a kind of regional, you know, immediately, immediately getting regional spillover from the enclave in Syria is considerable, and then you get it. You have the, you're going to have the situation. What do we do with them? And if we go down hard on them, they might turn against against the West, and and um, and that's that's that was my reason for you know, for for saying yesterday that we need to start thinking about these scenarios. What's going to happen when we when, when we crack down on the enclave in Syria. Mm -hmm. Asaf, do you have a uh, view on this? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, I think there's no doubt that, that Syria is, is a very important flashpoint right now. The question, of course, is what is a game changer? And, and does a game changer, like does a theater being a game changer necessarily involve that it's going to be the only show in town? And I don't think that that's necessarily uh, the case, which is, I think, the question you addressed uh, to Thomas. You know, um, I mean, I think Syria can be, uh, the, the, as I said, the new flashpoint, right? And certainly for years to come, uh, you know, but back, uh, you know, I don't know how many years ago, you know, Pakistan was like the future of, of jihadism. At some point it was Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. in, uh, in 2000, starting in uh, 2003 and the subsequent years. So, um, right, so, and this goes perhaps back, back to uh, David's point that right, we have, we can't really make great predictions, right, into the future. We have to be very careful about it. Um, but I certainly don't think that uh, I think that Syria is going to be a major hub of jihadi activity. I don't think that it's going to be like the only, like uh, the only hub. I think that certainly Africa offers, uh, you know, a huge, ample opportunity for jihadi activity. Um, you know, it is a vast territory, uh, borderless basically, and you can just see what happens now, right uh, after the French, uh, uh, the French uh, uh, invasion, right, and how all the jihadis are just going all over the place, right, not just to the surrounding mountains, but they've traveling now to, I mean, all the way to, to, to Libya and uh, some of them even perhaps uh, as far as uh, uh, the Sinai. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's, these things are very, very difficult uh, to predict, but, but certainly uh, Syria for a variety of reasons, some of which I, I pointed out in my talk, uh, is going to be the next big flashpoint. Mm -hmm. Randall, do you have a view on this? How much, how much Syria can be uh, Okay, we come to that in one second. In one second, let's hear Randall. Certainly. And I'm going to bring it back to the notion of identity and self-construct in that putting this in a broader contextualization, is Syria going to be a critical issue post-Sadat or during the, the current conflagration? Absolutely, in that it fulfills, it plays into the broader self-construction, self-concept from a social psychological standpoint, from a comm standpoint of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates more broadly in that we have the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq, we have the drawdown from Afghanistan, and we have the uprisings, we have the infiltration of various al-Qaeda groups and enclaves throughout the region. And here is a, a long-time, stable, autocratic, authoritarian regime that was, is being destabilized and potentially overthrown, and will be overthrown most likely. And so how does this play into it? It's part of the grand, grand scheme and the self-identification and self-construct of Allah is on our side, we're winning, we're gaining more ground, we're gaining, gaining greater victory. We are not being defeated. We may have setbacks, but we are winning, and this is a, a reinforcement, and therefore will fuel the movement even more so, I do believe. Thank you. I want to pick up on that question because uh, we're always talking about the local implications within Syria, we're always talking about whether and when they will turn against the West. What about the regional implications? What kind of a threat will jihadists in Syria pose to Jordan, to Israel, and to other countries? Asaf, you are Israel-based. You must be interested in this. Um, so I think, um, first of all, I think that you can probably answer the question much better than I can. Um, 
But, um, you know, I think that there have been recently some reports, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the open press, and that's the only reports I, I, I have, uh, that there has been, I think, very limited movements from Syria to Jordan uh, of uh, some, uh, some jihadists. Uh, so I do think that, that this is a threat that uh, Israel has to take uh, very, very seriously. So the, the, the Syrian threat posed to Israel, uh, it takes multiple forms, right? Uh, it's the threat of the, the possible you know, uh, seizure of, uh, of chemical bio biological weapons by, by jihadist uh, rebels. It's uh, right, the uh, ability of uh, Hezbollah to act as, uh, to, as an avenger of uh, uh, Assad in uh, case of, uh, of attacks against him, although I think that's less likely at the moment because Hezbollah is actually, in my opinion, at a relatively weak state because it's bogged down in, in Syria. Um, but certainly I think that, uh, right, I mean, these areas are obviously notoriously uh, poorly protected. Uh, it's not, I think, uh, very problematic to infiltrate Jordan from, uh, from the Syrian border. And so I think that this is probably, um, you know, if I were uh, uh, in your job, something I would be watching very closely, which I'm sure you do. Question to you, Thomas. We always talk about Western foreign fighters. How many Jordanians, Turks are currently fighting in Syria? Do you have any numbers or estimates about that? I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, hundreds, I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, several hundred. Um, and uh, to, your, to your earlier question, I think there are basically three, um, we'll see three main effects. Uh, one is uh, in Iraq, the other in Lebanon, and the third in um, the country, so the countries in North Africa that are sending foreign fighters. So when, when the foreign, when foreign fighters start trickling, trickling back, there will uh, there, there will be trouble. I'm, I'm less worried about um, Turkey and, and, and Jordan. They're both close American allies that can get uh, uh, support if needed. Already in the no in, in northern Jordan. Um, you know, the Sa Saudis are, have set up this operational base. There are reportedly CIA personnel there uh, training people, you know, sending in, you know, uh, specially trained uh, opposition activists. So it's a fair, I think it's, I see that as a fairly robust uh, front. Uh, so it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, pour out to the side rather than uh, up or down. On Lebanon? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But with this yes. regard of the kind of Jordanian participating the jihadists, it's very important to say that there's two different types of the Jordanians. There's a few Jordanians that will never will participate in this kind of the, uh, jihadist uh, activity, but the Palestinian Jordanian mm -hmm. will be. And all the Palestinian, all those who participate in jihad, in global jihad, either in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, or and what is your assessment from your own professional background as to as to the situation in Israel and how it will impact security about, in Israel? I asked about Jordan, not from the, not from the perspective of the kind of the, the military or operation threat, more about the ideological uh, mm -hmm. threat. Because I think, first of all, I will talk about Jordan, because I think that if the jihad will take over in Syria, it will absolutely will affect Jordanian uh, militants to go and try to uh, uprise against the, the regime in uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the threat against Israel is kind of an operational and uh, military threat that absolutely if any kind of military weapon or any kind of strategic weapon will fell into their hands, they will try to end it against Israel. Because this is the problem. You have to, say, to, to understand the idea of behind the global Islam, the radical Islam. The end station of going together is Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Global Islam, radical Islam wants to end in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem to start build up the, the global country. So definitely Israel isn't the focus of the global uh, jihad. Mm -hmm. And the idea at the end, if they will success, if, if they will build up the, 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 the global jihad, 
This one will be the, the focus, either from Jordan, uh, from uh, Syria, or from Egypt, and all the uh, surrounding. Mm -hmm. Even in the Afghanistan, they are all focusing, and they want to end in Jerusalem, and try from there uh, to start building up the, the caliphate and the ideology of uh, ruling the world. Mm -hmm. Can I have any other questions or comments about Syria, Danit? I actually think that the reason Syria is a game changer is the war of information. Mm -hmm. It is something that we experience to some extent in Egypt. Um, it's been present in Libya, not very, not in such an extensive way. But what happens here is the vast use of cyber information, cyber propaganda. <coughs> gain legitimacy on the ground. And you can see that it's evident. Every single person here talking about Syria is constantly talking about Jabhat al-Nusra. That's the names that, that have been written here. Like either Assad or Jabhat al-Nusra. And there's a reason for that. They are working extensively on creating legitimacy via the internet to actually transport it into the ground. And another key change point is that according to several interpretations of the Quran, the original caliphate will come from Damascus. So when they say, we're this close to getting hold of Damascus, they actually think the caliphate is going to come. It is exactly according to the Quran, and they truly believe it. Okay. We had one hand up in the back, please. And, and could you tell us who you are? Okay, let's begin with that, and then maybe we go back to Danit's point about the whole sort of online aspect and propaganda aspect of this, because that's also, I think, quite interesting. Asaf or Thomas, do you have any thoughts on, on co collaboration between Hezbollah? Well, clash. clash rather than collaboration, I would say, right? Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't understand uh, Hezbollah well enough to to say, um, and it's it's such a mess. And I and I, I hesitate to to, pr to predict uh, um, about uh, about Hezbollah. I, I would venture into speculation about you know, the broad features of the post-Assad phase, uh, which I think will be a triangular affair uh, with the FSA. <coughs> Uh, and uh, the Alawites and the jihadi enclave, and with some peripheral actors, the Kurds in the north, uh, and then the Hezbollah, um, and, and potentially you know some other international uh, presence. Um, but um, what this constellation of actors, you know, what this mix is going to produce in specific, I, I have no idea. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Asaf, do you have any? Uh, I'm also not uh, in the business of predicting, and I, I really have no idea what's going to happen. I, I have a hard time seeing any any outcome uh, that's going to lead to a stable Syria. Uh, I certainly don't see any outcome in which uh, the jihadis, uh, uh, the Sunni jihadists, and Hezbollah are uh, you know going to cooperate. So I I think that Syria is so important to uh, both of the may you know to both of the sides. Uh, uh, in this battle that, uh, you know, I just think that it's, we're going to see, I mean, Syria is not going to become a stable entity anytime soon. Uh, I would expect that Hezbollah is going to be part, you know, of, of whatever, uh, you know, clashes uh, are going to continue on in the future. Um, I do uh, tend to agree that uh, I think Syria is of the utmost importance uh, of Iran, and, uh, and Iran is going to put up... Uh, uh, a huge fight as it is right currently doing, uh, and it will continue to support uh, the Assad regime, you know, up to uh, as long as uh, uh, it will need. And once Assad is going to be step down, they're going to continue to be uh, uh, involved. Uh, and using Hezbollah is, is going to be the best way and the most, uh, you know, the, the the most effective way to do that. David, you wanted to. Well, I prompted you to. <laughs> and, and, the caveat about predictions being inherently difficult stands, but uh, I expect Hezbollah to play a little bit less of a role. 
Um, in part because I think their involvement in the Syria conflict is doing a great deal to discredit them. Um, so they're going to have a lot of shoring up to do. Uh, the major thing that I, that I expect, whether or not Hezbollah is involved on the ground, is you're going to basically have you know, Hobbes in action. Um, there's going to be you know, a war of all against all uh, with various factions, including you know, the Christians, the Alawites, the Shias, uh, Sunnis, jihadist factions, all vying for control. And then you get outside actors who are going to uh, try to pursue their own interests there as well, including Iran, uh, the United States, uh, quite po uh, probably Israel, um, certainly uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and you're going to have for several years just an enormous mess with everyone struggling to consolidate power and nobody quite doing it except over certain parts of the country. Does anyone in the audience have any so informed views about the, the post Assad scenario, please? And could you also please tell us who you are? Mm -hmm. But also a significant number of Jordanians and Lebanese. Okay. Any anyone has any? Thank you very much. Anyone has any um, views about post Assad and and Hezbollah and jihadists? Encourage you to come in because this is meant to be a workshop. No. Here. Oh yes, please. So your question is, what's the state of counterterrorism in the world? Oh, Pretty much. Vis-a-vis Syria. <laughs> vis -vis Syria. Vis -vis Syria, specifically? <laughs> okay. No, okay. Does, does anyone have any views on that? You know, I would just say that uh, you know, when, you, when you talk about counterterrorism strategy, right, uh, it doesn't just revolve around one particular aspect, but there, there, there are just so many different angles to it. Right, a counterterrorism strategy. Uh, perhaps, if you read the newspapers, you would uh, perhaps be led to believe that it revolves solely around the use of military force. But there are so many different, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects and, and cornerstones: uh, intelligence, you know, financing, uh, you know, uh, the attempt to uh, to curtail uh, the travel of uh, terrorist individuals, public diplomacy, um, and so. And then, of course, uh, cooperation is is one of these aspects. And I think that. You know, um, it, it's obviously a very, very broad question, but you will find cooperation uh, between certain countries, but not others, certainly between Western countries. Uh, you will find cooperation to be better on certain issues, but not on others. So I know it sounds, it, it, it's a very kind of a watered down question, but, uh, uh, sorry, watered down answer, but the, the question is, is very broad. Uh, but I do think that when it comes to the jihadi threat, there is a fair amount of, uh, of cooperation between uh, Western European uh, nations. I mean, more can certainly be done, but, you know, and, and Assad, we will come back to the question of Asaf. how to Asaf. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't Sorry. usually correct you, but in I that particular not, case, uh, I was not meant to I, be. I, I was fly. not meant to be an insult. <laughs> Asaf. Asaf. Um, we'll come back to to counterterrorism at the very end and what can be done about it. But I wanted to return to Danit's point about um, the media campaign. And uh, Randall, I don't know if you've been observing the propaganda or the materials that have come out with a specific focus on Syria. But uh, maybe you can comment on that or on Al-Qaeda's media strategy more generally. 
to start us off? Sure. I have not been looking specifically at Syria, to be honest, but I think it just falls into the broader campaign of what we were hearing here earlier about creating a sense of ideology, spreading the ideology, uh, informing the ideology, and winning over the belief system of a young group of individuals, or a group of young individuals, rather, to, or middle-aged, uh, I'm, I'm aged now, so I'm 25 is young, uh, <laughs> getting them to believe in the ideology and accept the ideology as a core principle to how they define themselves. Again, I keep bringing it back to identity because identity, as we see Dr. Ahmed this mo was talking this morning about a program in, in Pakistan and trying to reintegrate young middle-aged boys, 15 to 17, back into a normalized Pakistani life after having been recruited into the Taliban. And how it began for one young boy being educated by, if you will, by a Taliban ideologist, uh, helping him to buy into a belief system and perspective of himself as heroic in fighting for a cause. And I think what, what the media campaign is all about is helping individuals who are in search of a sense of a cause beyond themselves because quite honestly, I think more broadly within societies, Western societies, the United States, not speaking critically of, the, of Israel, um, we really don't have much of a, most people do not have much of a cause beyond themselves in terms of, self, in terms of achieving their own professional career aspirations. There is no cause. So the World War II, the greatest generation, we had individuals fighting for causes that were beyond above themselves. So in this case we have, again, individuals searching for a cause greater than themselves and wanting to be part of something that's greater than themselves and buying into a belief system that supports that and for which they can be heroic. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Building on that and going back to Donit's point who, is, who, who stated that this is more perhaps than previous jihadist campaigns an information war. Do you agree with that, David? Uh, yes, I agree with that. And I'd say one should also look at what's happening in North Africa with the various Ansar al-Sharia groups, um, in, both in Libya and also Tunisia. Uh, both of them, uh, actually what Nusra is doing and what ISIS is doing to a lesser degree really reminds me of what the Ansar al-Sharia groups are doing and I think is in modeled... In the media respect? Oh, yeah, I'm going to explain it. Just yeah. okay. I'm speaking specifically to media, and yeah. I'll explain okay. the similarity. Yeah. Um, this, you know, I, I think that it's actually modeled off of the North Africa campaigns, which are not military campaigns. They're Dawa campaigns. Uh, I did field research in Tunisia, and one thing that, that was obvious when I was there is that what they're actually doing on the ground doesn't uh, match their social media presence. They have uh, a very active Facebook page, and... Uh, Basically, you know, Ansar al-Sharia will send out a convoy and they'll provide you know, some medicine and some food and they'll immediately post it to Facebook. And they're doing this constantly. It's a frenetic pace of activity, which makes it seem like they're doing all this humanitarian work. When you actually look at it on the ground, they're not servicing any community more than once every few months. But they have this frenetic pace throughout the country and they use social media to establish a presence. Like it's, it's really a, a fairly sophisticated campaign. Now, turning to Syria, uh, you have the same sort of dynamic with social media being used, uh, you know, this pace of getting things out via YouTube and others with a lot of symbolic value to it. It's very interesting. I mentioned a, ki a kid's fun day before, uh, which uh, you know, th there's lots of videos on, on YouTube of that. Another thing that was interesting uh, was a video that they had posted uh, it, it was either ISIS or Nusra, I forget which one off the top of my head. But they posted this video which was very rife with symbolism. Um, it, showed this, uh, it showed a bunch of, of um, sandbags that were set up. Uh, you know, there was uh, an automatic weapon lead, uh, leaning against them. And there was this bowl put out for a dog. And there's a dog you know, sitting there licking up the water. And you know, what it, what it was, the, the symbolism was very clear, right? That um, they, you know, that in the midst of a conflict, they had water out for a dog. And especially if you know what fund Islamic fundamentalist groups think of dogs, <laughs> that's rife with even more symbolism. 
Um, so, so, yeah, the media campaign is something very much worth paying attention to. And one of the reasons I mentioned it in the context of Anshar Sharia, which again is Dawa as opposed to Jihad, is because you have basically media TTPs, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures um, that I think are migrating and being shared, and these groups are all watching each other. Mm -hmm. We have two people who want to come in. Yes. Could you also tell us who you are? We'll take the second one, then we'll answer both of them together. Thank you. What sponsors do you have in mind? Well, it's probably gold sponsors. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the question. Sorry. To what extent has the role of the of, of sponsors of um, opposition rebel fighting groups in Syria changed? Right? Yes. yes. Changed compared to what? Compared to. So in other words, we're talking about what has changed since the Arab Spring. So do you think that? So maybe you can start us off, Thomas, by, by, by telling us who are the sponsors specifically of the jihadist groups? Where do they get their funds, their weapons, etc. from? Uh, we don't know, is a short answer. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, everyone you know, mentions the Gulf, you know, private donors in the Gulf, uh, and that's probably, you know, broadly speaking, where it comes from. But no, nobody, I think, in the, none of us working with open source uh, material can say exactly where it's coming from. Uh, um, uh, what we do know, though, is is that the main, that most of the weaponry and money c going into the rebel side of uh, Syria is going from Saudi and Qatar to the FSA. So the Saudis are, the government is directing all of its resources, pretty m almost all of its resources, to the most moderate part of the uh, opposition, uh, and then um, the money to the jihadi. Most of the money to the jihadi groups is coming from private uh, private donors. Now, there's a chronological evolution here to address your your question, uh, which is that the the the, the Saudi gov the Saudi government, you know, sig stepped up its support effort significantly uh, in the second half of 2012. Um, and uh, it's only escalated since. Uh, there's some, some, recent, some very detailed recent reporting, especially in the, with the Wall Street Journal, about the role of the Saudi government and, and specifically the, the role played by Bandar uh, in, in coordinating this. Uh, and the operation is, is getting bigger and bigger, but it's something that dates back to, to mid-2012, as far as I can tell. Um, David, do you want to come in on this, or no? I was going to come in on the other question. 
Okay, well, well, let me move to the other question, which is what I want to move to, So, because we've spent like a, a good deal of time talking about Syria. And uh, your question was a good uh, lead to the next question, which is to talk a little bit about other affiliates before we talk about counterterrorism and ideology. Of the other affiliates that you're seeing out there, very simplistically asked, which one is the one that you most watch? that you're most interested in because you think they are potentially the strongest, the most capable, the most interesting story of the next five to ten years? That, that, that's pretty easy. Uh, okay. I, think, I think ACAP, without any question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the elevation of Waheshi uh, to being Al-Qaeda's general manager indicates that uh, the core is expanding, like, in my view, and there are some who conceptualize this a, little, a bit differently, but in my view, it means that the core is extending itself into Yemen. Um, I think that, in my view, Waheshi could always be considered a part of the core in terms of its history. Um, and now uh, ACAP is going to be playing even more of a role in directing the network. In my view, uh, they've already been fairly important in this regard. And I think their importance is going to grow. And here's the, the follow-on based on his question. To what extent, if they really become very powerful, would they be tempted at some point to stage a coup, if you want, and become the new Al-Qaeda central? Th that's a great question. Um, I, look, if, first of all, if Al-Qaeda central gets decimated, I think it's a given that Yemen, uh, that, that ACAP becomes the new Al-Qaeda central. You know, there's no reason that one of the affiliates can't just step up and become the core. Um, so if the core gets decimated, that doesn't mean Al-Qaeda is dead. Um, if Zawahiri were killed tomorrow, uh, I think that Waheshi would become the new emir of Al-Qaeda, and the core would be in Yemen. Um, in terms of whether they would stage a coup, uh, I think that the answer is no. I mean, that's, that's actually a, a very interesting question. But it gets into kind of this broader debate amongst analysts, which, which matters a lot. And it's a question about the nature of Al-Qaeda. And not kind of, you know, sometimes when we talk about what is the nature of Al-Qaeda, it seems like it's kind of this philosophical question uh, where, you know, is it, is it an ideology? You know, is it an organization? Maybe it's a little bit of both. And, you know, to some, ex you know, to some extent, there's a little bit of our own philosophy built in. But let me, let me explain how it actually is very concrete and real. If you look back to what Al-Qaeda was uh, on September the 11th of 2001, it was a highly bureaucratized organization. You know, it, it, in fact, in many ways modeled after you know, corporations that you might see in the West or, you know, or, or elsewhere in the world. It was highly bureaucratized, um, you know, even having reporting requirements for uh, people, showing, you know, people handing in their expenses. You know, there, there were lots of committees to do many different things, ranging from you know, Sharia committees to humanitarian committees, Dawa committees, uh, military committees, which were also bureaucratized. And the question is, and this is where analysts diverge, does that bureaucracy still exist? Like, if it does, then the question of what is Al-Qaeda isn't just a philosophical question, but you actually have an invisible structure that we're having trouble seeing. Now, the, uh, the releases that you first got about the Abbottabad documents that were captured when bin Laden was killed, um, it, the, the newspapers clearly reported that what analysts found was an Al-Qaeda that was more centralized than they had believed. The, the documents that have been released from Abbottabad, the 17 documents, 18 if you count one that came out in Germany, um, those don't really you know, tell us much at all, anything really, about Al-Qaeda's structure. You, you don't even have a complete correspondence to those documents that came out. So I would suggest that, there, that when more documents from Abbottabad are released, and I believe that they should be, there's no reason not to release them, we'll know much more about where the organizational structure stood uh, at the time bin Laden was killed, which in turn will tell us much more about where they are today. Anyway, to get to my answer, um, I think that, that the um, ties of bayat, you know, oath of loyalty, are important within the organization. And I believe that, um, that Waheshi would, would maintain his oath of bayat to Ayman al-Zawahiri, so there would not be a coup. But what you might see if ACAP eclipses uh, al-Qaeda core is ACAP functioning much more autonomously with Zawahiri just kind of giving his sign-off to things that ACAP already has in process because it's more efficient to run it out of Yemen. Mm -hmm. 
Asab, let me continue with you. Do you have any view on um, on so, affiliates and so so I'm by nature uh, somebody who, who really likes to look at the big picture. So it's hard for me to like pick one affiliate and say you know I, I would personally like to focus on that. But um, I mean I agree that AQAP is probably the affiliate that's uh, um, that is uh, in some ways uh, in many ways the strongest. Um, but I, I also personally like to uh, follow AQIM and AQI and AQI or ISIS or however you, you want to call it now. Uh, but for, for, for different reasons, uh, I mean, ISIS or the Islamic State of, uh, uh, of Iraq and Greater Syria um, is really interesting in the sense that it became kind of a, a counterweight, I think, to uh, Al Qaeda Central. And I'm saying this because uh, it is, we probably have seen recently one of the first times when uh, the head of an uh, Al Qaeda affiliate has openly defied the, the leader of, uh, of, of the Al Qaeda network. Uh, and this happened. After the uh, attempted, uh, you know, merger between uh, between uh, uh, the ISI and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, which Zawahiri said was not approved, and so he asked, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, he asked ISI to uh, to annul uh, the merger. And in response, um, you know, AQI was pretty uh, defined, and so that was something which I I personally have not seen to that extent that somebody was like openly defined. I'm not sure that this would have happened had uh, where Al Qaeda still led by, uh, by Osama bin Laden. So I think the entire kind of relationship between AQI, uh, ISIS, and, um, uh, and Al-Qaeda Central is very, very interesting. Uh, AQIM, I think, is also fascinating to watch, and I think it's going to be, continue to be uh, relevant, but for, for perhaps other reasons, right? Uh, it's, I think, really interesting to see how AQIM funds itself, right? The kidnappings it did. Uh, AQIM is probably uh, the most wealthy affiliate, uh, the most wealthy uh, affiliate. Um, you know, the interplay between uh, AQIM's uh, terrorist you know, insurgency and, 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 and criminal uh, organization, its uh, involvement in, in drug trade is also very, very interesting. We can learn a lot about that. So. Any other views? Uh, yes, so uh, two, two comments. Uh, to your question about what uh, I follow, um, I, I, right at the moment, I happen to follow. Try, I, I happen to be trying to follow most of the affiliates um, um, to get an overall picture. But um, just like uh, the preferences of jihadis are revealed through their, you know, operational investments, uh, our investment at my center reveals something about our uh, thinking about this. We had money to hire one uh, master's fellow this year, and we put her to work on the jihadi groups in Syria. Mm -hmm. I think those are the groups that are the least well understood and that, that have the greatest potential to becoming a major threat. As I have said on several occasions at this conference, I don't think they have a strategy of attacking the West at the moment, but if they do adopt such a strategy, they'll be very dangerous because of all the foreign fighters there. Um, um, and on the issue of loyalty between the affiliates and the core, I think that loyalty eroded a long time ago. I mean, in, in, in practice, the, 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 they have drifted apart. They started drifting apart in the early two, 2000s. And they've long, the affiliates you know, uh, and the core have had different, you know, divergent preferences for many years. Um, uh, uh, there's some overlap still, the things they agree on, but in, in a lot of sort of practical um, uh, you know, it is a prioritization. They they differ, uh, and um, so, and I think if a uh, if an affiliate got very powerful, got to consolidate territory and and, sort of, and, and, and and govern, that would just make them drift further apart from the strategy of, of AQ Core. Okay, with uh, please raise your hands if you have any questions or comments. Yes, sir. Iran and Russia, as in, oh, they are hitting Iran or Russia. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is there any talk about that? I have, I have not seen anything uh, on the forums, for example, uh, about that. Although they're, you know, they're supportive of the, you know, the Baluchi jihadis in, in southern Iran, and they're supportive of the Chechens and so on, and would probably applaud attacks. I haven't seen anything, any specific sort of talk about or attempt of, you know, specific plots 
mm -hmm. straight out of Syria to you know onto Iran or, or Russia. I haven't seen that, but um, this is. I mean, this has been lo long been a proposition. It was uh, is is uh, the Al Qaeda is Al Qaeda going to turn to a major power other than the U.S.? You know, are they going to go turn to China because of the mm. Uyghurs mm. and because China is getting bigger? Um, Brian Fishman has written about this, and uh, it's possible. But I think it's a, at this point, it's uh, if it happens, it's going to be the odd thing, not a major strategy. Mm -hmm. David, uh, I, I agree. With, I agree with that response, and just wanted to add one small um, thing, which is the amount of anti-Shia animus being produced right now by uh, Al Qaeda affiliates is rather striking. You know, it reminds me of uh, Zarqawi uh, when he was in control of, of AQI and his writing on the Shias. Um, you know, Saeed al-Shihri, who was the deputy of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, just got killed. After he died, they revealed who he posted as in jihadi forums. So I went back through all of the posts to try to get a better sense and actually learned a lot of very interesting things in the process. Uh, but one thing is, is you know, he has passages where he talks about how he sees... Uh, the Shias, and he throws Iran in a few times, uh, sees them as a bigger threat than the United States or Israel. Uh, very interesting rhetoric, uh, which it doesn't lead me to, to see, I mean, I agree with Thomas, I don't see a direct plot coming at Iran right now, uh, but that anti-Shia rhetoric is on the upswing, and I do think that means something. Yes, sir, you had... Um I agree. I think you're very right to, 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 to ask that, that question. And I think um, um, it's very likely that Assad will cling on to power for, for a long time, for many, many years. Um, uh, why, why do I expect him to fall eventually? Um, uh, mainly because of the... Uh, balance of international forces that the, the you know the Saudis you know and and the US and Europe can pump more resources into the theater than Iran can it's the bottom line uh, and also uh, there's a Russia f factor we're not entirely sure whether you know Russia will stand by Assad forever there's, you know there's, that, there's an insecurity there that you know that may change change um, um, and it certainly, it's not going to get bigger. The Russian support for Assad is not going to get bigger. It can only get there's only a downside to it. So I, I think eventually it will fall, but it may take several years. I agree. One more question on affiliates, and then we move on. Um, with, you know, hopefully maybe a quick answer for many of you in the audience or, or panelists. We've discussed uh, what you think is the most important affiliate right now, the potentially most powerful one. Which one do you think will be the next affiliate? And does it even matter? By the next affiliate, you mean what group will become an official affiliate that isn't exactly. right now? I mean, I, I think that the next official affiliates uh, will be the uh, Ansar al-Sharia groups, uh, probably with Egypt being the first of those, um, followed by, you know, who cares? Uh, I think what we may find uh, you know, we, we may find that they've actually been affiliates all along, uh, in which case a lot of analysts are going to feel pretty stupid because essentially, you know, if, if that's correct, that they've been unacknowledged affiliates this entire time, then essentially what the story of the last few years will be is a story of Al-Qaeda putting on a new hat and people pointing at Al-Qaeda and saying, wait, that's not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has never worn that hat before. Um, that may be what we find. If not, then I do think that, that Egypt is just about there. Mm -hmm. Thomas, any uh, 
uh, I don't think it matters very much. I, I must have seen ten, at least ten um, bachelor's and master's theses uh, that it asks the question, you know, what is the effect of an Al-Qaeda affiliation on the, mm -hmm. the behavior of an affiliate? And I've never seen any inc conclusive evidence. Uh, I don't see any clear pattern uh, in, uh, with regard to behavior, behavioral change or capacity increase uh, in an affiliate when it, when it formally you know, gets an approval. Um, uh, and I don't see, th I don't see <coughs> formal affiliation being correlated uh, with, with with you know, particular forms of behavior uh, either. So I, I think uh, a lot of the discussion around the affiliation and the buyer is, is, is not very consequential. Mm. I think but, but, uh, uh, just hold, hold on, Asaf, one second. But wouldn't you, just to, to, to kind of um, challenge you a little bit on that, is, wasn't it the case in case of uh, Al-Shabaab, for example, formal affiliation actually led to a lot of conflict within the group and arguably to to uh, almost a split within the movement. So it did have an effect there. I don't know Shabab well enough, so uh, I actually can't answer that question. My sense is though is, is that there were, you know, there were debates, you know, there, there'll be debates about affiliation before, before it happens mm -hmm. as well. So you know, it can have, a, can have a, a negative effect even without it happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and because you, 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 you know, the, often it, you know, it's basically a debate about you know how global should you go, uh, and that debate you know you can have that even without the affiliation. That's true. That's true. David, and, and then we come to us. Uh, I just a couple quick quick points. I, I think that um, a lot of our analysis of Shabab and the degree to which the Al Qaeda affiliation is split Shabab is very much overstated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that a lot of Western analysis focuses in on a few data points and doesn't actually hit the big picture of discussions uh, within Shabab. Okay. Asaf? Um, uh, I have to say, I, uh, it's very rare that I disagree with uh, Thomas, but I do think that there are some actually, that there, there can be some, some uh, there can be a, a bit of an impact, I think, for affiliation. I think about the GSPC, for example. As soon as it became an official Al-Qaeda affiliate and became AQIM, it started to adopt a suicide tactic, which it hadn't done before, and not only that, but it also started to target international targets at the UN, for example. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to become uh, a formal affiliate in order to start adopting suicide attacks. But so I think I, I agree that it matters more whether I would say it, it matters more whether somebody adopts jihadi ideology or not. And, and right, but, but 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 so there are some exceptions. I think when when, when formal affiliation does have actual and tactical. Who do you think will be next then? Um, I agree that it, it mostly doesn't, um, I think it mostly does not really matter. I think what's more interesting to me actually, um, and I don't have a good guess, but, but what's more interesting to me is that we don't, I think that there's a lot of uh, debate about what is actually a formal affiliate. And I think that you know, a, lot of, a lot of these terms are actually thrown around uh, loosely. And I think that Al-Shabaab uh, Al I think is a, good, is a good example because you know, many people have always spoken or even before it became a formal affiliate, it's spoken about Al Shabaab as a as an affiliate. Um, but to become an affiliate, I think it's important not just that the group, uh, you know, pledges allegiance to uh, to Osama bin Laden or to uh, Zawahiri, but that has to be reciprocated by the leadership of, of Al Qaeda Central. And, and short of that, I think we cannot speak of a formal uh, uh, affiliation. And so, you know, to some people it might not matter, and these might just be, you know, uh, semantics. But, um, but in that regard, I think that, um, you know, uh, I think the, the, an additional issue is, you know, when does an affiliate merge with the group, right? So uh, Al-Shabaab is oftentimes uh, said to have merged with Al-Qaeda, which I think is, is also not true in that mm -hmm. sense, right? This is not a merger a la, you know, uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad. So I think a lot of these terms are thrown around very loosely, and we have to be very careful, mm -hmm. right, with, with, with these terms. So I want to uh, uh, open the section on ideology by asking a question to Randall. Uh, based on your study of both Inspire but also other kinds of terrorism, the Unabomber, and other types of ideology, would you say that this narrative that you see presented in places like Inspire is an unusually powerful, strong one compared to the other narratives that you have seen? Is it more likely, perhaps, to create that sort of identity than other ideologies? 
How would you rate it compared to your previous experiences? I think quite honestly the easy answer to that is that yes, it is more powerful and why is it more powerful? But we, it's a, a neo-fascist ideology that's grounded in religiosity as opposed to the ideology of Mein Kampf that was nationalistic in nature. This is clearly much more powerful because it, it advocates and promulgates an ideology <coughs> that is based in a spiritual belief system that advocates the individual to do something that is beyond themselves, engage in something that is greater than themselves, and commit themselves to something that is greater than themselves, and give themselves in the cause of something that is greater than themselves to bring about an idealistic state. Not to live, but to die to bring about that idealistic state. My comp, fascism was all about, and as we've seen, Nazism, socialism, so forth, have failed. But it was all about living to bring about a nationalistic end state. Even the Unabomber, that was nihilistic. It was just simply violence. But this is really something that's living to die, to live again in a spiritual realm. So yes, it's much more powerful. And that's really the challenge, I think, going forward, is how do we counter that? How do we counter that? And in speaking to the issue of where are we with counterterrorism, quite honestly, I, I'm sorry from my perspective, that's where we need to be dedicating our focus, is how are we addressing and creating counter-narratives to alter that ideology and the reasons for why people become jihadists and engage in terrorist activities, specifically jihadism. Mm -hmm. would, would the other panelists um, say that in terms of the strength of the ideology, nature of the ideology, it is stronger, more popular now than it used to be five, ten years ago, less popular. So far we've talked about Al-Qaeda, the organization, particular battlefields, but in terms of the global view, as our colleague wanted here, in terms of a global view, the popularity of the ideology, what would you say is the strength of that right now? Any of you? Well, um, We've, <clears throat> here we face uh, a problem very similar to that of the strength of Al-Qaeda. And here I disagree slightly with, uh, or I'm sort of not entirely satisfied by David's uh, suggestion that we should focus more on ideology than on Al-Qaeda, because we have the same problem with ideology. What is, what is, uh, uh, what is jihadi ideology? What is Salafi jihadism? Um, you ask 10 scholars, you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, and if you look, if you move to the kind of the, the the, everyone can agree on the core things that are easy to, to, to code. You move to the, fr to the fringe, to the end of the borderline examples, and you're going to get a lot of different de decisions, coding decisions, on, on whether something is or is not a Salafi Jihadi group. What I would um, suge suggest is, is uh, or, or my, my way of answering um, your question, Peter, would be to just look at you know, how many groups and how many people um, uh, you know, can be described as Islamist and are uh, you know, um, using violence. So you have more militant Islamist groups around today than five years ago. And uh, this tells you something important. Uh, wh whether or not you know, Salafi jihadism, whatever that is, uh, you know, is, is, is stronger or not, is, I think it's very hard to measure. David? The interesting thing uh, about your disagreement is the answer you gave was actually much like what I was advocating before. Uh, because I wasn't saying we should focus on the ideology. I actually agree that that's kind of an empty thing. What I was saying is focus on the movement. Like focus on groups that you can actually define as falling within a specific type of ideology. And so in this case, when you look at, say, Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia, um, you're very clear where they have stood. Uh, you have Zawahiri on their social media. Uh, they just released a statement very recently denying organizational ties to al-Qaeda, but saying, yeah, we've been with al-Qaeda from the very outset, um, defying themselves as falling within it. I mean, ultimately, I agree with your answer. Um, I think the answer is correct, that we see more militant movements, and we see more militants that ascribe to a militant ideology, meaning that they would type themselves as falling with, uh, in line with al-Qaeda in terms of their worldview and they're organized at the same time. I think that the question of popularity mm -hmm. is one that, that we often get wrong because we look at popularity kind of as opinion polling. 
like, it, do, do more people hate al-Qaeda or like al-Qaeda? Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually not the right question. I think from a strategic perspective, the right question is, in areas where they might gain a foothold, where Salafi jihadism of that type might gain a foothold, uh, do you find more willing recipients? And I think that in addition to there being more militant movements, you also have more movements who ascribe to that worldview and also are active and organized. Ansar al-Shari in Tunisia is a good example of that, but also you had the same kind of organizing in Egypt as well after the fall of Mubarak. Uh, the fact that you have these burgeoning movements in addition to those who are actually engaged in warfare right now is a good indication that overall it's becoming a more popular worldview, one that more people are ascribing to than was the case five or six years ago. Sir, sir. I would say that Uh, just to go back to the previous point with the ideology, uh, I wanted to just add something to that uh, debate because I think that we oftentimes think of ideology as something very static, right? We think that uh, you know, communism has uh, you know certain doctrinal elements, A, B, C, right? And uh, and I think we sometimes have a tendency uh, to think the same about jihadism, right? As as an ideology, or as a religious ideology. But I think that, um, and I think social movement scholarship has contributed a lot to our understanding of ideology. Ideology is something that is pretty dynamic, it's adaptive, and we can see that, I think, perfectly in the example of Al-Qaeda. I think in many ways, uh, the West has been pretty successful, actually, in fighting Al-Qaeda's ideology, um, not by going and having theological debates, but by actually highlighting the negative effects that jihadi ideology has had, right, on killing more Muslims than it has. So basically, by pointing out this, this huge uh, contradiction that Salafi jihadists argue that you know they're, what they're doing is basically for the benefit of Muslims, but at the end of the day, they're killing Muslims, right, in far greater numbers. And so I think that what Al Qaeda has done in response, right, Al Qaeda is evolving; it's it's it's, it's learning, right, as has been mentioned before. And so Al there has been a shift in Al Qaeda's ideology towards one that uh, you know is more attuned to local issues. It doesn't mean that Al Qaeda is generally concerned about local, or as uh, Vahid Brown would have said, like classical uh, classical jihad, right? Uh, for example. That it's only that, but, but, but basically, I think that Al Qaeda has recognized that most Muslims care more about foreign occupation, for example, than uh, they necessarily think that we have to attack the West. So I think that global jihadi ideology, the idea of attacking the West, um, has suffered 
uh, and I think that Al Qaeda has adjusted and it has accepted more this idea of classical jihad. It has recognized that most Muslims uh, are more uh, attuned to the classical, would buy into the, the, the notion of classical jihad. Did, can, I, can I just ask Thomas, because he's, uh, he's going to, at some point in the future, he's been telling me about it for about three years, publish a book about Abdullah Azam, the, the creator of classical jihad. Would you, would you say that there has been an upsurge of interest in, in those sorts of ideas? an abandoning of the more expansive jihad and a return to Abdullah Azam's version? Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, the, the, you know, the foreign fighter phenomenon, uh, which is another way of, sort of, another term for you know, the practice of, sort of classical jihadism, uh, the practice, the, the activity where you, you, you get involved in other Muslim Muslims wars uh, and, and, and wage you know, semi-conventional warfare against enemies in uniform rather than engaging in international terrorism. This, uh, has, been, uh, this has been popular all along. It was always pop more popular than uh, bin Laden's anti-America strategy in the 90s. It's, it's been big since the late, late 1980s. And um, uh, you know, I think there will only be sort of you know, many minor fluctuations along the way. So what's happened is that the Yes, the the willingness, <clears throat> the number of people willing to engage in uh, attacks on the homeland are is significantly reduced, mm -hmm. um, but not but not eradicated. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to say uh, to make an, uh, to say something else about this ideology um, a d a d debate. Um, I think it, you know, it's very important, of course, to to understand ideology and to understand that terrorism. You know, a terrorist group requires, um, you know, logistical support. It requires, you know, a friendly, uh, you know, local population that can provide them all kinds of services and cover and, and so on. That and that, you know, a militant group is, you know, is dependent on support from non-militant activists uh, that are sort of, you know, ideologically or, or, or emotionally sort of positively inclined to them. But I think that it's, it's dangerous to uh, uh, to go down the path of thinking that we should use coercive means against uh, all sympathizers. Um, uh, partly for the point, for the reason I mentioned earlier, that that um, uh, nobody agrees what the what the salient ideology is. So what, and, and so, if we decide, yeah, we're going to go after the Salafis. Or the Salafi jihadis. No. People don't agree who they are, so you end up. You're going to end up, you know, not only with probably overreach, but also you know varying practices, in, uh, inconsistent practices uh, over time. Um, uh, and um, I think you, you're also going to end up. You, you may end up producing more militants than you are. Mm -hmm. Preventing. If you use too coercive means against just sympathizers or people that you, by some criteria, deem to be part of the same ideological movement, um, then you can you can cause a lot of problems. You can you can create the motivations that you're the ideology that you're trying to 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 defeat. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's you know this criterion of you know of militancy of, of you know focusing on the actors that actually perpetrate or directly facilitate violence is a key distinction uh, that should guide uh, the most, our mm. use of the most coercive means. That, but that does not mean that we should stop looking at ideology or trying to understand it or uh, you know, condemn it when we can or undermine it and so on. It's very important. But just when we talk about coercion, yeah. let's focus on the, on the, on the okay. violence. Any more questions and comments about, yeah, Danit and then gentlemen here. But 
But shouldn't you then expect to see a lot more attacks? There is an increase. It's not, it's gradual. Given it's a gradual on these uh, people, let's say we have a German kid rapping or in the name of Allah, <coughs> a Muslim, and it's all across the web. Other German kids see it and they're like, oh my God, this is so cool that this guy's rapping for Allah. It has an effect. Even though, if, even if they don't attack, if they facilitate, if they fund, if they support ideologically, this is still something we should, we should be concerned about. Mm. What if the global efforts are just really efficient in terms of the internet? Yeah, well, I think, we're, I mean, there's lots of different issues um, um, that need to be dealt with separately, but. <clears throat> I think what you what you try, what you what you what you're suggesting, uh, you know, is 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 the general uh, proposition that the internet is causing more people to get involved in some kind of militant Islamist activism. Oh, did she, she said it makes it easier to spread the and cheaper, yeah. right, <laughs> to spread the ideology. So they can still focus locally, mm -hmm. but they can also have a global reach. Yeah. Oh, you mean for recruitment? Yeah. Or for operate or for attacks? Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, the internet has been you know, pr you know, presented as the, the a game changer f uh, regularly for the past 10 years. And as I can, you know, if you look at the, you know, the pattern of operations in, in the West in particular, you know, nothing suggests that such a game change has taken place. Um, it's not translating, the, you know, the, the, pr the presence of the internet hasn't translated into a massive wave of terrorism in the West, so clearly the, the you know the, the internet isn't quite the game changer that that one 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 um, that many have 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 suspected. Now, <clears throat> uh, it's clear that the internet has a lot of has a lot of, of, of benefits, especially for kind of low risk uh, activities like fundraising, like uh, spreading spreading propaganda, um, and. You know, in some contexts, in, in some places and times, this may uh, have this may you know make more people uh, become militants than would otherwise do it. But the bottom line, the, the, the key point is this, which is often forgotten in the debate about the internet, which is that there's a there are lots of problems uh, facing a, a terrorist group that tries to use the internet. There are lots of limitations to it. The trust issue, for example. If you're going to coordinate an attack across the, the web, how do you know that the person you're dealing with at the other end is, is who he says, he says he is? How do you know he's not a, you know, a government infiltrator? How do you know that the, li the line of communication is not being watched, etc.? cetera? Um, th there are lots of uh, limitations that I think explain <coughs> this fact that okay. the internet has not uh, radically Don't. altered. Uh, let's, let's get David, because we're running out of time, but let's get David in uh, on this. Clearly, jihadist groups have invested in what you're talking about, that they're, they're trying to rally people to attack and carry out individual jihad. There's a lot of propaganda devoted to that. I agree with Thomas that at the end of the day, it just hasn't been that effective. I mean, you can, you can look at people who were motivated this way, and one thing it shows is that Al-Qaeda has been unable to come up with a single individual out of the you know, dozens or hundreds they've motivated to carry out individual jihad, hundreds is a little bit too high, but out of the, the many dozens, they've been unable to come up with a single individual who's half as effective as Anders Breivik was. What? About what? what about Boston? Well, well, number one, that's not an individual. I mean, you had mul multiple yeah, individuals. Number two, they may have ended up training. And number three, they still weren't as effective as Anders Breivik was. Um, but the second thing I want to say very quickly is that when we're talking about global jihad, um, we tend to talk about it as though, it's, as though it's an end in itself. And I think it's important to understand that at this phase, it's actually a means to an end. If you go back to the original debates about uh, near enemy versus far enemy, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the United States ended up a target was because the US was perceived as a big barrier to toppling governments within the region and setting up an Islamic state there. Uh, that's where I think the Arab Spring changes a lot of things. And that's, to me, uh, one of the answers to the puzzle that Thomas put forward in his first speech. I agree with him 
that the affiliates' resources are not focused on attacking the West. And I think a big part of the reason is that they have so many opportunities within the region now that didn't exist before that undertaking attacks on Western countries isn't really necessary to meet their immediate goals in a way it was prior to 9-11. Okay. So, and yes, Randall. I'd just like to offer a, a final thought on this. As a communication professor and understanding social influences, social influence processes and social psychology a bit, admittedly the internet has not produced the extreme number of incidents and individuals that we might have expected or Al-Qaeda might have hoped for. But the issue is that it's planting a seed. And the seed takes time to grow. Fascism in Nazi Germany did not develop overnight and within a five year period. It grew, it began with a youthful generation. It takes time to mature, to maturate, to flower and to produce its offspring and the, the ideology. So not to diminish the, the points of my colleagues here, but as a mechanism, as a medium for communicating an idea, a perspective, an ideology, a belief system that might appeal to particular individuals, it's in its infancy. It's only just begun, and the seeds are being planted. And it's those seeds that we need to be concerned about that are they being planted in soil that is going to be receptive to the idea and thereby produce the type of outcomes that we would fear and be concerned about. And I agree with you, Randall, and I disagree with my friends here, Tom and David. And since I'm the chair, I will not elaborate. And we'll, <laughs> we'll remain neutral, but please uh, look up some of the stuff that I've written about this because I do agree with you, Daniel. Um, as the very last thing today, I want to prompt every member of the panel and then maybe leave a couple of minutes for, for people who are in the audience to tell me, what, maybe even the general here, to give me one suggestion as to what they believe is the most important thing that should be done now to counter Al-Qaeda. And maybe we're starting with Randall. Thank you for putting me on. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been pretty uh, myopic in my discussion today about what I think is critically important. And while Al-Qaeda is an organization, and its affiliates are organizations, and they are comprised of multiple entities, you come down to it, it's the individual. And from my perspective, it's critical for us to understand, and there's a great deal of research about this, what makes an individual become a terrorist. But in trying to understand and put our focus on what is it that Salafi jihadists are articulating about themselves and trying to promulgate to try to appeal to individuals to engage in violence. What is it about what they are saying that is appealing to certain individuals to become members of these groups? And that's where I think going forward, attention needs to be dedicated to. I know that there are folks doing that. I think we need to perhaps dedicate more of our attention to that. What is it that's being said, and why is it so freaking appealing? Mm -hmm. Asaf. Uh, so obviously, caveat is that there is not one solution. Uh, I think we've been really good at uh, killing people with, uh, with drones, and uh, so, um, and that's a debate in itself. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in uh, trying to wait, uh, you know, understand the ideology and trying to counter that by highlighting uh, the negative effects. There's been some. Uh, uh, some improvement on, uh, in that regard, uh, but it's an ongoing fight because, again, uh, Al-Qaeda's ideology is uh, it's constantly evolving, so now uh, we have to pay more attention to, uh, the, idea, uh, to the affiliates, uh, and so uh, I think that counterterrorism has to have a very, very strong local focus, um, mm -hmm. and it's very context-dependent. Tom, what should be the priority? Um. <laughs> What an insanely difficult question. Um, I mean, the, it depends on the, what domain we're talking about. But, um, uh, and there are so many things that are important. But, I, I, but my bottom line is that you know, the approach we need to um, eliminate the, you know, the, at least the Al you know, the, those Al-Qaeda groups that are coming after the West, uh, they're fundamentally the same that 
that that um, have been used against other terrorist organizations in in, in past. It's, it's uh, identifying, you know, the key operatives and the leaders, um, and uh, arresting them or killing them if necessary, uh, so that you you know you you. You, you physically, you know, you, you, you dismantle the, the organization, the thing, the, 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 the mechanism that is translating, you know, the, the ideology and the grievances into actual plots. Uh, there are lots of grievances and ideologies out there, but it's, the, it's this machinery of the organization that's translating the, 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 these motivations into, into actions that you need to target. Um, okay. Uh, now, of course, that's not the only thing we need to do, there are lots more, but okay. that's the key. So focusing on radicalization, for lack of a better word, local issues, targeting networks, which is very much in line with President Obama's counterterrorism strategy. That's what he wants to do. Surprise us, David. Come with a shocker. <laughs> in my book, Bin Laden's Legacy, okay. there's a central metaphor. Um, and that central metaphor is um, the Muhammad Ali-George Foreman fight. Uh -huh where uh, Foreman was the strongest, biggest fighter of his generation, and everyone expected him to knock out Muhammad Ali. Um, in, this, in this fight, uh, Ali went up against the ropes, which a boxer should never do, uh, because he realized that the elastic ropes would absorb the majority of Foreman's blows. Um, Foreman hit him for round after round after round, and everyone thought Foreman was winning. Um, but he got visibly tired, and then Muhammad Ali knocked him out. What he did was he turned... George Foreman's strength into a weapon against him. And that is how a small actor fights against a large actor like the United States. Turn your enemy's strength into a weapon against it. And that's precisely which has been done post 9-11. The US's strength has been turned into, an, uh, into a weapon against it. So I think the key thing we need to do is understand that Al Qaeda's strategy actually depends upon economics depends upon grinding down the American economy and the economy of Western countries. This isn't a secret. Bin Laden has said this on multiple occasions. So what we need to do, the key thing, is to reduce the cost of counterterrorism in order to make our counterterrorism efforts sustainable. Um, this includes uh, maybe taking approaches that are a bit counterintuitive but might pay off uh, better strategically. Do you wait to target in order to take out more of a network? Instead of targeting right away, do you maybe learn about a network and try to take out multiple nodes at once? Um, do you, and I was talking to General Abbasade about this briefly, um, do you actually wait as they try to establish an emirate and watch, see how things go, and let the locals understand just how bad it is? Like, that's one thing that really hurt al-Qaeda in Iraq. That's one thing that really hurt al-Shabaab. It's contrary to the way we do business, but in the long term, is it more strategically effective? Um, do you interject yourself less into conflicts in order to make sure that, our, that local governments are bearing the cost of CT and actually you know, putting more of a local face on these efforts? Again, a little bit contrary to the way we tend to do things, maybe more strategic in the long term, but we have to have our eye on the sustainability of our efforts. Excellent. Thank you very much. And now... I want to give an opportunity to this gentleman here, who I've forgotten before. I, I'm very conscious of that. Do you have an idea for what we can do to counter Al Qaeda? Uh, mm -hmm.
Okay. That was very important information. I think that's, that's something that we need to further investigate. And I thank you. I'm sorry I have to cut you off at this point because we have to finish at five. But thank you very much for your contribution. And before you all get up and leave, let me first of all thank you all for participating. Let me thank the panelists for making excellent contributions. And let me say that this has been, in my view, a very productive exercise. We've addressed a lot of very good issues in a structured way. I hope you've taken at least one, day, uh, one idea away from this workshop, because that means success. Thank you very much.